Welcome back. And in this lesson, we're going to be talking about how to convert a normal program or a terminal-based program into a GUI-based program. Now, the first big thing to note is that the back end of most of these programs is still going to work the same way. Remember, when we communicate between classes, we send messages. The thing about these messages, though, is that they're stored inside your computer. It doesn't matter if you're dealing with a terminal-based program or a GUI-based program, because those messages still have to exist. The only difference, the messages are going to be going instead of from your uh, objects inside of your class to the terminal or to the console if you're using Eclipse, to the user directly onto their screen. Now this is a little bit of a change. In the back end, it means it's a little bit more taxing because you have to have multiple different classes taking messages. This is why GUI programs are a little bit more difficult. In addition, GUI-based programs have more animations, they have a lot more dynamic calculations, which also make them more difficult to use from a uh, computer resource perspective. Again, usually this doesn't matter because we have so many computer resources available to us, memory, CPU usage, that it doesn't even matter in today's world. Now, the only thing to note, though, is that when you're building a program, like we're going to be talking about a program where you need to take multiple different types of objects from the user, you have to make sure you make everything very, very clear. When you're dealing with menu-based programs, like our previous programs, for example, the calculator program, originally before we added the command line arguments, we simply gave the user a menu, we asked them to enter which value they wanted, then they entered the inputs. It was pretty easy. And the part of labeling was also done very easily. The menu itself was the label. Compare that to a GUI-based program. In a GUI-based program, you have to have the labels and you have to have your frames separately. This means a lot more work. If you notice, our program, the uh, temperature converter program, was fairly long. It was about a 50 line program, even though it does something that you could probably do inside if you wanted to, 10 lines if you want to be very, very concise. This is the point about GUIs. Because it looks so nice, that's pretty much the cost of having a very nice looking program. The fact that it's going to be this taxing on your uh, computer and how much you have to type out. This is why people don't tend to develop GUI programs unless necessary. Why we didn't talk about them up till now is because, well, if there's this much typing, and a lot of it's fairly repetitive, then we don't need to. The terminal program works just as well. But if you want your program to look nice and to be usable to the general audience, to general people, you want to build a GUI-based program. Originally, all programs were terminal-based. Then, as the operating system started to update in the 90s and uh, late 80s, GUI-based programs and GUI-based operating systems became a lot more popular, and therefore the paradigm shifted. Now everybody expects GUI-based programs, and they barely can function with a terminal-based program. So if you're shipping your program to a general audience, you want to make sure it's GUI-based, even if it takes a lot more time and typing. Now, how to convert a normal program into GUI has a couple of big rules. First of all, we have to change all the places that we used to use strings and output and change them into text fields. What I mean by this is previously, when we had a program like this, we would have multiple system to out dot print lines. You can go back to any of our programs, for example, even the operators or the home program. All of these had a lot of system to out dot print lines because that was the only way we had to communicate to the user. We always used strings and we always communicated by providing them values. With a GUI based program, it's a little bit different. We now can condense our form into a couple of lines. Previously, if you needed to have an interaction with the user, let's say you had that program that we did previously where you needed to uh, keep on entering values until you entered negative one that we did when we first tested at Sentinels. This program would work fairly well in GUI because all you'd have to do is keep on entering numbers. You would only need a single line. You'd only need a single text field. Whereas when we built it inside of a terminal-based program, it was going to be fairly long. Loops, therefore, become a little bit less useful. Previously, when we had to keep on outputting values, we needed loops. Now, we don't really need loops because every single time they hit a button, it'll automatically refresh and it'll automatically take those new values. So make sure that all the places that we used to output a string, we now, instead of saying system to out print line, we create text fields or text areas, and then we would say uh, set text and get text. Another rule is that if you need to take the value 
from a uh, field and you need to add to it, that's a very, very important step. Remember, the set text method standard, uh, the standard version of that, will simply wipe out the old version. But many times, we need to build a program where we take the old value and then we add to it. Let's say you wanted to create a program where you kept on adding to a running list of the user's values. Well, to do this, it's a little bit complicated using a GUI because, well, your old version with the terminal would just, you keep on entering the values and it would store them in an array. With the GUI-based version, if you want to keep on updating the list to the user, you have to make sure you say, get the text, then create a new string, add your old string, what used to be there, to what you want to be there now, and then set that to the new value. So you basically have to extract the old value and then just copy that into the new value so that it can build a running list. It's very difficult to build running lists with GUIs, so if you can avoid it, please do because it's very taxing and it's a little bit repetitive to keep on saying get text, add to a string, and then set text. But there's a lot of scenarios where you need to, as you'll see later on, and in these scenarios, there's no harm in just making sure you follow that rule. If you forget to, though, it's similar to if you forget to have the plus equals on an extended assignment operator. You'll still have a valid result. It'll still give you a string. The only difference is that string won't be building the entire time. It'll instead create itself once and then keep on uh, updating that value, which means instead of having a running list, you have the final value, which probably ruins the point of the program. Now, when we built our program, the Fahrenheit tester and the uh, converter program, it was pretty easy because all we needed to do was we needed to take the value and we could keep on pressing these buttons. But let's say you wanted to hide some of the buttons. This is where the set visible becomes very important. And if you want to make something unchangeable, the set editable. Now the set visible is probably the more powerful of the two. Let's say you had to build a program where you needed to first create a GUI. They had to press a button. For example, they could press convert to Celsius. Then you need to create a new screen, a new set of uh, print, a new set of outputs. So some new buttons, some new strings, everything like that. And you need to get rid of all this stuff. Now with the GUI, you actually can't simply get rid of stuff. It doesn't work that way. So you would have to hide the old values. What this means is that you would have to take this button. You would have to say whatever we called it. In this case, uh, we called it convert one. You would have to say, for example, convert one dot set visible and then you would say false now what would this do it would simply change your button and now hide it let's try this out so if we run our program again you'll notice we put it inside the button clicked so initially it's going to be fine but then if we press convert to Celsius you'll notice the button disappears and you'll notice it shifted a little bit the button is part of what defines the columns if the button is no longer there then the center of, the, uh, of that area of that column no longer has to be there either, and it'll start to shift. In addition, sometimes when you are hiding these buttons, you want to make them appear again. This is where you'd use the set visible to true. Remember, the default place for a button and for most of these objects is going to be true. Most of the time, you want to be able to see the button. So saying set visible to true is only going to be needed if, you're taking, if you made it invisible before. This visible and invisible isn't like how you might think of it. It's not like if they accidentally click on the wrong place, they'll still be able to click on the button. Making it invisible makes it impossible to reach. Even if you're using a computer and perfectly nail the location, it's impossible. It just doesn't exist anymore. It's been hidden from the user. To make it usable again, you'd have to say set visible to true. The same thing happens with the set editable. The set editable just says, can we change this value now? So for example, if we took one of our text fields, let's say we wanted to take the Celsius text field, we could say Celsius dot set uh, editable. And you'll notice that now it, we have a method here and it's a valid method call. So we can say false. Now the only thing that this will do is it says, well, the value, the field will still be there. So if we run the program and we uh, decide to let's say enter in 15 or 0.15 and then we hit convert to Celsius it works fine but now you'll notice that the Celsius field has been hidden this means that we can see it it's there and we can still access it we can still read it but we can't change it the important thing to note here 
that not being able to change it doesn't mean your program can't change it. When you say set editable, that means that the user can't change it. That means that when I open the GUI, I won't be able to change that value. On the other hand, your program itself can still change the value. For example, I can still say set text on Celsius, or I could still say uh, get text. It's not like it's been completely eliminated, it's just that now the user can't change that value. Now you might be saying, well, what's the point of this? We already have labels. If we needed to have a value that you shouldn't be able to change, that's what a label is. Labels can never be changed by the user as a rule. Well, a, this type of uh, value is very useful because, well, first of all, it's useful if you have a J text area. A text area, if you recall, is a much bigger form of a text field, multiple lines long. The only thing to note is that many times you need to display a lot of text. Let's say you were generating 100 random characters and you needed to output all of them. Well, you don't want the user to be able to change those values because they're random, that's the point. So you would say, well, we set the text to those random values and then we set editable to false. That way we can have a consistent way of outputting to the user without having to continually change it. And while you could use a simple label, labels aren't meant to be used this way. Labels, just like the name would suggest, are to label something else. They aren't supposed to be a value themselves. What I mean by this is the temperature, if we were doing it that way, let's say you only could t convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius and not the other way back, well, the temperature is something we need to output. We shouldn't have to label it. The point of the label is supposed to say that this is what this stands for. You would put the label on top of that output, but you wouldn't want the output itself to be that. In the same way, you uh, to have an analogy, if you had a book and a book had some diagrams, everything could be a diagram in theory, but the diagrams are only to explain something else. Even though in theory you could make every single part of the book a diagram, it wouldn't make sense. It's a waste of time and it's a waste of space. In that same way, we don't want to make every uh, label the actual value itself. Labels are supposed to be used for some other data type, for some other uh, data type or some other output form not as the output form themselves. This gets back at one of those object-oriented programming principles that sometimes it's not how you, it's not the fact that you're doing it, it's how you do it. Our goal here is to make sure that we not just output, but we output in an elegant way and a way that's maintainable. Labels are much harder to maintain than simple text fields. So if you have to continually output something and it's a way you tell the user, it's your way of communicating back to the user, make a text field don't make a label. In addition, never terminate your program unless the user chooses to close the program. This is a big difference. When we built our normal terminal-based programs, we always terminated automatically. It was assumed that they only need one run. If we needed to let them have as many runs as they wanted, we built a do-while loop around the entire program. When we're dealing with GUIs, it's the opposite way around. We assume that they want to keep going forever. This means you should build your program in such a way that it's easily maintainable, that it easily scales up. You don't want your program, for example, to be taking a hard value and then setting everything to non-editable and uh, invisible. You want to make sure that it's, um, it should work perfectly over one run and over a hundred runs. There should be no difference and it shouldn't slow down in any way. So when you have your program like this, never terminate automatically. If you have an error statement that arises, for example, if we run our program, uh, the temperature converter program, that is, and we decide that we want this to be a word instead or a group of characters instead of a normal double value, you'll notice we still get the errors that we used to. There's still a very, very long list of errors. But the difference is, instead of abnormally terminating the program, the program still is there. The only difference is that one run of the program didn't work. So if you're building your program, only use the system.exit. Only quit your program if the user presses the quit button. Otherwise, it's assumed that the user wants to keep going. In addition, we should talk about message boxes. Message boxes are our way of talking to uh, the user in an ext in a extreme scenario. Usually, these are if you want to notify them of a either terminating scenario or if you have a big error. For example, if you wanted to catch the ability that, hey, this isn't a word, or if you were checking to make sure if something was a palindrome, which is a word that's the same forwards and backwards, and you said, well, it's not, you should usually message them in a message box. What is a message, message box, you might say? Well, 
a message box is just another type of object. We could say message box, and then we'll call it x is equal to new message box, and then we give a, a message to the user. Let's say finished conversion. And then if we put in our semicolon, you'll notice we're still going to have an error. This is because, and if you mouse over, you'll see it, a message box requires a JFrame object to go off of. So we always say this dot message box. And then we put in our string itself. So what this just does is it says, well, the JFrame that we're working with in this case is going to be our window itself. So if you run your program now, and we enter, for example, 15, and then you hit convert to Celsius, you'll notice we get a little message right here. Now, the message box is, again, for extraneous circumstances. So this is actually a violation of that. You would want to use them if you have an error scenario or if the user entered something that should terminate the program, but you want to inform them before you stop it. For example, if they had won a game of cards or if you were making a program that modeled poker and one person had won, you would give them a message box to indicate that the game has ended. Now, there's a couple of constructors for message boxes. This is the default one, but there is also a constructor that lets you specify the size. So you could say 300 by 100, and this will just say the dimensions of the message box. You'll notice that the message boxes are usually pretty small, but if you want it to be, if you want to give the exact size of the message box, then you can do so using that constructor. Again, not a huge change, just a little bit of a style choice if you want to be very specific. Finally, we should always use classes whenever possible. GUIs already have a lot of classes. This makes it very convenient if we just want to add a couple more classes. You'll notice this is why we use the temp converter instead of adding this right in. The main class itself, in GUI programs, it's actually not, out, it's not outrageous to have a very, very long main class, in this case, the temp class. So in general, if you want your program to be maintainable, use a lot of outside classes. That way, you can follow OOP and still make your program as easy to use as possible. While naming, though, make sure you give special names. You'll notice we always called ours Fahrenheit, Quit, Convert, Far, Cell. So when you have these many objects, and many of these objects are going to be overlapping, three of these objects right here, the Fahrenheit, Convert1, and Far, all deal with the Fahrenheit conversion. Therefore, when you're dealing with a scenario like this, tie them together. Don't just give random names. We used to be able to get away with this when we were dealing with standard objects, as long as you remembered. When you're dealing with GUIs, it's going to maybe have 10, 15 objects. So you have to make sure you give descriptive names and that the names make sense together because there's going to be very many names. In addition, keep all of your actions together. So again, pick a uh, paradigm, either make all of your, for example, text fields, then your buttons, then your labels, or put all of the Fahrenheit's together. So Fahrenheit, convert one, far. Then Celsius, convert two, and cell. Keep everything together in some sort of fashion. That way, you have a pattern you can always follow. Hopefully you've enjoyed this lesson. To summarize, in this lesson, we talked about the benefits of a GUI uh, versus a normal program. We talked about how that affects our thinking. We talked about how to convert from a normal to a GUI and a couple of big rules to keep in mind. We have to change all the places we used to use strings and output them into text fields as opposed to system to out print lines. We have to take values from text fields and change it back when we output. So we have to use the same box, the same text field for input and output. Set to invisible if you want to hide a button. Make sure you use the set editable method if you don't want somebody to be able to change it. And we talked about when we use labels versus text fields. We talked about message boxes and how they only should be used for extraordinary circumstances or error scenarios, how we shouldn't terminate programs unless the user chooses to, how to use a field for uh, writing and reading, and how we can use classes when we're using GUIs because we already have so many classes, it makes a lot more sense to use objects than it did previously, and how we have to make sure we give very descriptive names because there's going to be a lot of different classes to use. It's not unheard of to have 10, 20, or even 30 objects in a single class. Hopefully you've enjoyed this lesson, and hopefully you'll join us for our next lesson.